I've endured many hardships to test my determination. I went without food for many days. I refused to lie down to sleep for many nights. Endurance became the food to nourish my heart, and diligence the pillow to rest my head. Reclaiming Lost Treasure Mei Chi Gao withdrew from the world and entered a cloistered spiritual realm. Although her dream was achieved, her work had just begun. The nuns lived in their own section of the monastery, separated from the monks' quarters by tall, thick clumps of tangled bamboo. Here, Meiji Gao was given a tiny hut, so newly constructed that its split bamboo floor and walls were still freshly green and shiny, and the thatch of its grass roof still dense and bushy. Meiji Dung was the senior-most nun in the community. Meiji Gao had been present six years earlier when Meiji Dung solemnly took her vows in this same monastery, and had always admired and respected her, both as a close family friend and as a devout and dedicated renunciant. She set the example for the younger nuns, who looked to her for inspiration. Together with Meiji Ying, who ordained shortly after her, Meiji Dang made sure that the small group of women at Wat Nong Nong remained focused and in proper harmony. Meiji Gao began her new life by stepping into its quiet rhythm at the earliest stirring of the first new day. She rose at 3 a.m. each morning and washed the sleep from her face with handfuls of cold water. She then lit a candle lantern and stepped onto the meditation path beside her hut to take up her practice, silently repeating Butto, Butto. With each pair of footsteps, she internalized her senses and concentrated her mind until she felt fully awake and sufficiently fresh to continue her meditation in a seated position. Sitting still and erect, she maintained her calm, peaceful concentration until daybreak. She then hurried toward the main sala to join the monks and nuns for the morning chanting. When the soft cadence of the chanting faded to a close, the monks and nuns remained in a still contemplative silence for several minutes. Afterwards, the nuns gathered in the open-air kitchen to cook rice and prepare simple dishes to augment the offerings the monks received on their daily alms round. Meiji Gao cheerfully helped with the cooking chores and then joined the nuns for their daily meal. Like the monks, the nuns ate only one meal a day a practice that suited their meditative lifestyle. Eating less often, and only small amounts, lightens the work of meditation. Eating too much can easily make the mental faculties sluggish and unresponsive, and greed and obsession for food can be a corrosive poison in the mind. Once the chores of cooking and cleaning were completed, the nuns turned their full attention to meditation, buoyant in body and spirit, and free of concern about food for the rest of the day. Taking care of simple necessities, such as cooking and cleaning, the nuns helped foster the well-being of the whole monastic community. Mindful and composed, each afternoon they emerged from their dwellings to pick up long-handled brooms of flexible bamboo twigs, and swept clean the area around each hut and the winding paths that interlaced the nuns' quarters. They then dusted and swept the kitchen area, put the pots and dishes neatly away, and remembered to place handfuls of raw rice in water to soak overnight. They bathed and laundered quietly at the well. In the gathering dusk, the nuns walked together to the main sala to join the monks for the evening chanting. Because it was dark by the time the meeting adjourned, the nuns used long stem candles to guide them back to their dwellings, where they continued to meditate late into the night. Striving alone at her small hut, Meiji Gao alternated between walking and sitting as she struggled to regain her former adeptness at deep concentration. She had not practiced formal meditation since John Mun left her village twenty years before, and the rigors of her personal life and household cluttered her mind with endless petty concerns. Still, it had also taught her the value of effort. So she fixed her mind and worked on her meditation as if it were a rice field, stolidly plowing it through, furrow upon furrow, butto upon butto. She had always known how to work with persistence and perseverance. These were qualities she could count on. Once she put her worldly life firmly behind, narrowing her focus on the bare simplicity of the task at hand, she progressed swiftly on a path that would frighten most people in their first few steps. Seated in meditation, surrounded by the late night stillness, her body and mind seemed to fall abruptly, as if off a steep cliff or down a wall, and everything vanished into absolute stillness. Nothing registered in her awareness but the awareness itself. 
awareness permeated with a knowing presence so profound and so vibrant that it totally transcended body and mind. The experience lasted for only a brief moment, a moment of perfect peace. As she emerged from it, her mind sharp and radiantly clear, she knew that she had finally reclaimed a lost treasure. Emerging gradually from that state of deep samadhi, she felt a strange and unfamiliar vista open within her heart, as though she had awakened in the midst of a dream. Seemingly out of nowhere, the ghost-like image of a man, his head severed at the trunk, floated slowly into her vision. Watching with horror, Mei Chi Gao saw that the headless ghost had a single fiery eyeball embedded in the middle of its chest, a red-hot orb that stared directly at her with menacing ferocity. Feeling threatened and unprepared, she thought to escape. As her concentration wavered, her fear and uncertainty increased. In concert with her mounting fear, the ghastly apparition grew in size and intensity, as though feeding off the fear's negative energy. Panic began to envelop her heart. Then, suddenly, she remembered a John Mun and his advice to never run away from fear, but to always face it with mindfulness and clear comprehension. With that reminder, a clear awareness reasserted itself, fixing her mind firmly again in the present moment, a moment of pure and simple perception. Focusing on the intense feeling of panic pulsating in her heart, and withdrawing her attention from the headless ghost, allowed her emotional state to stabilize, and the fear to gradually subside and disappear. And with that, the frightening vision simply faded away and vanished. Withdrawing from Samadhi and returning to ordinary consciousness, Meiji Gao contemplated the dangers presented by fear. She realized intuitively that the fear itself was the real danger, not the image that induced it. Images perceived in meditation are merely mental phenomena that have no inherent power to harm one's body or mind. They are neutral and, in and of themselves, carry no specific meaning. The mind's interpretation of them is the crucial point and the source of danger. An interpretation brings about a reaction of fear and loathing, which are poisonous and negative emotions that destabilize the mind, threaten its equilibrium, and endanger its sanity. Focusing attention on the terrifying aspects of an image instinctively magnifies the negative emotional reaction and increases the danger. Withdrawing attention from the image and focusing on the fear itself restores it solidly to the present moment where fear and image can no longer coexist. Meiji Gao realized then, with clear insight, that only unrestrained fear could harm her in meditation. The meditation that Ajahn Mun had taught her was deceptively simple, and the rhythmic repetition of Butto made it appear easy. But the massive effort required to focus her mind on a single object after so many years of neglect made meditation frustratingly difficult at first. She felt her body and mind out of sync, as though they were tugging against each other. The mind needed one thing, the body wanted another. The mind wanted this, the body needed that. Disharmony prevailed. Too much food brought lethargy. Too little escalated errant thinking. She pondered how to balance eating and sleeping, walking and sitting, communal and personal. She wondered how to maintain a sharp, mindful focus during each changing moment and every new circumstance throughout the day. Meiji Gao experimented with fasting, going entirely without food for several days at a time. But she discovered that lack of food left her feeling mentally dull and sluggish, and vulnerable to changing moods and wayward thoughts as if the flow of her spiritual energy was somehow constricted. That subtle hindrance seemed to lessen her motivation to intensify in meditation. She knew that many of the monks in Ajahn Man's tutelage found fasting to be a valuable tool for advancing their spiritual development. They regularly endured hunger and discomfort because fasting increased their mental vigilance, making the mind bold and its focus sharp. But Meiji Gao's mind failed to respond positively. So, in the end, she concluded that going without food did not suit her temperament. Going without sleep, however, was a different matter. Meiji Gao passed most of the second month of her retreat in three postures, sitting, standing, and walking, but never lying down. She started the sitter's practice as another experiment, an attempt to find a practical way of accelerating her meditation that took advantage of her natural strengths. She discovered that refraining from sleep rendered her mind so bright and sharp, so calm and serene, mindful and alert, that she practiced continuously for 21 days without ever lying down. With each day of sleeplessness, her meditation deepened and her confidence grew. 
sharpened spiritual faculties made her courageous and daring, which coordinated perfectly with her bold and adventurous nature. Her unusual visions, more frequent than before, became more extraordinary as well, sometimes foreseeing future events or perceiving non-physical realms, at times revealing profound truths of the Buddhist teaching. Emerging from deep samadhi late one night, Meiji Gao saw a vision of her body lifeless and stretched across a weaver's loom. Consumed by an advanced state of decay, the body was bloated and discolored, and the skin had split open, oozing pus. Writhing maggots, sleek and fat, were devouring the rotting flesh. The graphic realness of the vision shocked and frightened her. Suddenly, she felt a John Munn's presence close behind her, as though he were peering over her shoulder at the grotesque scene. Slowly, deliberately, he reminded her that death is the natural consequence of birth. All creatures born into this world will eventually die, their bodies decaying and returning to their natural elements in precisely the same manner. Indeed, everything in the universe is impermanent and constantly changing. Everything will disintegrate and disappear. Although death is always with us, we rarely contemplate it. Azan Man then instructed her that she must start to earnestly contemplate her own birth, aging, sickness, and death.